Hello, everyone, and welcome to Artists Honoring Women. I'm going to start today's conversation with our land acknowledgement before we continue. Uh, we would like to begin this program by recognizing that while we gather in the Santa Clara County, we are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Tamian Ohlone, which included the lands of the Polenos and who were related to the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in Muek Maloney tribe, who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and San Francisco. The lands on which Santa Clara County are established was and continues to be of great significance to the Muek Maloney tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Muek Maloney constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. Thank you for joining us today for the sixth Artist Honoring Women Conversation. For those of you that are new to this um, conversation, my name is Amanda Rawson and I work with Art Builds Community. I will be moderating the conversation uh, at the end of this, this um, presentation. Uh, I'm excited to introduce to you Artists Honoring Women. It is a program under womanhood, a Santa Clara County-wide art-centered project that will recognize the historic contributions of Santa Clara County women across all intersectional identities to the region and beyond. To find out more about the Womanhood Project, please visit the project's website at www.womenhoodproject.org and sign up for emails to keep informed on what's next. So what is Womanhood? Womanhood is a public art and digital media project that will commission interactive, educational, and accessible artifacts and public artworks to promote the historical representation and recognition of women in Santa Clara. I am very excited to introduce today's artist, educator, activist, and community arts pioneer, Dr. Judy, Judith Baca. One of America's leading visual artists, Dr. Judith Baca has been creating public art for four decades. In 1974, she founded the city of Los Angeles first mural program, which produced over 400 murals and employed thousands of local participants. The program evolved into the arts organization, Social and Public Art Resource Center. Baca has stood for art in service of equity for all people. Her public arts initiatives reflect the lives and concerns of populations that have been historically disenfranchised, including women, the working poor, youth, the elderly, and immigrant communities throughout Los Angeles and increasingly in national and international venues. Her most well-known work is The Great Wall of Los Angeles. In 2017, The Great Wall of Los Angeles received national recognition on the National Registry of Historic Places by the United States Department of the Interior. So joining me in welcoming today's guest, Dr. Judith Baca. Welcome, welcome, Judy. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, happy to uh, be here with you and to um, have a focused conversation about the issues of women and monuments. Absolutely, we are excited to have you. So um, we will we'll go ahead and move forward with your presentation and afterwards we'll have opportunity to have um, some great conversation and questions from our audience. Great. Well, I brought a few slides here today to, to talk about um, a piece that um, um, I did in, 19, in 2008 and um, it's called The Arch of Equity and Justice. And it's on the San Jose uh, campus, uh, university campus. And um, if you could just slide, we'll talk about this. Um, and um, it's actually interesting because it's, it's not exactly a monument to women, but it is a women's sensibility in terms of how a monument should be made. Because the question for me was, how do you remember someone uh, uh, like Cesar Chavez um, who, who could not really be represented in a bronze statue on horseback or as a you know soldier that had uh, triumphed over people. But instead, uh, how would you make a, a monument that would talk about what he stood for, his, uh, not his personality, but his ideals and belief, beliefs? Aside, please. Um, he is, uh, his work was really about, um, a life uh, about victories for the improvements of the lives of workers who feed a nation, those workers who plant and tend and harvest the food that feed us. Uh, well, they at times cannot afford the same food they grow for others, and they suffer injuries in the fields and uh, inhumane working conditions. And this is not something in the past. People often say, you know, didn't that get taken care of? It wasn't the United Farm Workers effective at transforming it? 
today we still have exactly the same kinds of issues that are that people face as essential workers in the field and in the most difficult working conditions. So my thought was to create a piece that um, looked at this man's strength through his belief system and to produce a work that was permanent on the campus. And in fact, I, I started looking at, you know, triumphant ar arches. This is a, these are the uh, two paintings that were created to become um, Byzantine mosaics, which are permanent mosaics uh, in the monument. Slide, please. Uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, slide, please. So part of this is a passage, it's kind of the, uh, uh, the uh, paseo from one part of the campus to the other. And in a sense, it's, a, a tri it's, it's modeled after the triumphant arches of, of Europe. Um, but his, his uh, imagery, his, his representation is not the kind of representation you would think of a, of, of a monument to a person. It's not a bust, um, it's not a statue. Um, and I think people think instantly, if you're going to do a monument to uh, somebody who is as iconic and as powerful as Cesar Chavez was in terms of creating change, um, that you would you would do something like that. So I began to look at triumphant arches. And the arches themselves, uh, you know, were, are used all over Europe and Mexico. And I thought, how could we make something that would use the power of such an arch, but at the same time not actually um, replicate the European model. Slide, please. So there are five Byzantine mosaics in this, in this piece, but it's modeled after uh, um, a corbelled uh, arch, a Mayan arch. And it, it represents essentially, this is a, a, a pre-Hispanic site, and it, it, it makes reference to Chavez's um, Spanish and indigenous uh, mestizo roots. Um, the arch itself is painted uh, with a pearlescent quality of gold uh, reflectiveness in the surface. And that's modeled after the ground clamshells that were put into the white paint of the missions. Slide, please. So what I thought was that as I began to do this research is that um, the Chavez wouldn't be represented on the outside of the arch. He would not be the dominant feature as you walked up to the arch, but that you would pass through the arch and that it was kind of a, 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 um, a calling to the students who were being educated at San Jose State. And this region that is really the growers region and, the, and, the, and comes out of the agricultural um, movement of, Los, of, Cal, of California, and that passing through the arch would take them from being an educated person to being a person that enacts their education in the world. And uh, so, so the, you, you, the, the surfaces are glistening as if the ground clamshells are placed into the white paint. And the two exterior images are, are Dolores Huerta and Gandhi. And um, selecting Dolores Huerta to place on the front of this was kind of a, an unusual move, but because she is a pillar in the, the development of the United Farm Workers, it was important for her to have a presence holding up this arch and the United Farm Workers Eagle. The Eagle is made of you know, about three tons of stacked glass and so that it has a luminescent quality to it. And um, the light transfers through the, the, the UFW flag. And this of course is a, a reverse pyramid. It was um, uh, developed by uh, um, Cesar's brother. And um, on the right is Gandhi and um, Tavis studied very intently the, the practice of nonviolence and of fasting as a method of actually bringing things to the forefront in terms of um, dealing with the issues that uh, uh, the farm workers were facing. And of course, his most famous action was the great boycott. Slide, please. So the, 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 the arch has a kind of broad shouldered look, quality of strength. But at the same time, it is it has this um, kind of elegance. Um, it did, I think is almost feminine in the sense that it is both um, uh, strength, strength, but also uh, 
and not the kind of triumph over people kind of arch that you would see in, in many European models. And up into the surfaces are um, Byzantine glass. There's over 200,000 pieces of glass that were made in Mexico. And what, what's really important to me was that um, to create this Byzantine glass and make it um, absolutely permanent and talk about the story of, of um, the boycott that was transformative in terms of bringing growers to representation and understanding of, of the um, United Farm Workers needs for basic human rights. Although this has not been entirely accomplished, um, there was great strides in the, uh, the loss of the, the short hoe, uh, which was one of the um, issues that uh, you can mark as a triumph for Cesar Chavez. Slide please. So it is, um, on, and so on the face of the monument, uh, it's as I said, there's it's not Chavez, but the face of the monument are those that he represented, the campesinos, both men and women, on the left and right in these Byzantine mosaics, which are modeled from paintings that I made, and then those paintings were um, brought to um, um, a small town outside of uh, Cuernavaca, where there's an entire factory that was actually very critical in, in, in building many of the mosaics of the Los Tres Grandes in Mexico. And what was really uh, fascinating is that when I went there and talked with the women that primarily the women who did the cutting of the glass and um, they were the sort of representation of them by their fingers being bandaged from the small cuts of the, of the breaking of the glass and then shaping it. They created these big models, these um, um, pounces that uh, were on paper and then dropped those colors into the surfaces uh, to represent my paintings. And they were exacting in the interest of even modeling the, the movement of the, the mosaic glass to the, to the movement of my brush. Um, on the left, you'll see the woman with a short hoe. And this is, and, and, and on the right, the, both of them are, are, are harvesting with a, uh, attending the fields with a short hoe. This is perhaps one of the most damaging of all tools that really uh, injured the backs of the, of the farm workers. And uh, Chavez uh, um, fought very hard to um, allow workers to use a, a longer hoe. And the reason the growers were so interested in this stooping and this uh, backbreaking work was that they believed that bringing their, the workers' eyes closer to the plant would keep them from making any mistakes and damaging the plants. So the short hoe was favored by the growers and was abolished by the United Farm Workers. And you see that the piece, uh, it, the, the, the arch is standing in the middle of a circle. Um, this slide, please, you can see the close up of this view of the two workers. Um, and the, uh, the, the background is in the sepia tone and, and almost like a, a, a calling to the dust bowl and to the, the, the difficulty of working in the fields. I spent um, about two years uh, in the Central Valley working uh, in a small town called Guadalupe to produce a, another series of work on the issues the farm workers were facing. And so I had a very close up view of what it was like to run behind a machine, um, to not have water and um, uh, facilities, uh, toilet facilities within reach and the, um, the rashes and the other things that occur for the farm workers working in the fields because of the pesticides. Uh, slide, please. So in this image, you can see it completed. And um, uh, he's, uh, Chavez is wearing uh, the Guavallero uh, uh, shirt, uh, which is actually a, um, very well known in the Filipino community and also in the in the Mexican community, a kind of dress shirt. He has a UFW button on him and he's standing in the fields of the vineyards. The vineyards being uh, among the worst for um, the experience of farm workers. I, I think that and the strawberries where they're crawling between the rows um, were really great um, learning experiences for me to watch people do this harvest, which is really, really high um, highly skilled labor. So Chavez stands among the, 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 the vineyards that represent the tortured body of the worker. Um, so the, the figure, the plant is 
undulating as if it is a crucifixion, as if it is um, a person. And uh, it's that relationship between the living plants and the, and the workers that, that I, was, um, I was going for here in this image. Um, this is the, about a, a nine foot piece um, that is uh, made of thousands of Byzantine tiles matched to my painting and then created in, um, in Mexico and then brought back the completed, that we had to finish the last of the, um, uh, the mosaics here. And it was really hard to find anybody skilled, as skilled as these women were. And I asked them when they saw the Chavez image coming up, um, I said, do you know who this is? And a, a woman looked up, you know, who was uh, working in the glass factory and, and she said, uh, an indigenous woman, and she said, he's a man who works for the people. And I thought, wow, and even here in this tiny town, they knew who Chavez is. Slide, please. So I was able to um, also support their, uh, the work in this, in, in this little factory and the kind of campesino workers that were the same as the ones in the field. Um, here is um, Chavez breaking a 25 day fast with Robert Kennedy um, and, and, and um, um, taking the, the host as they're, they're doing a mass. And to the right, to the left is, uh, to the right is Chavez's mother and the Virgen of Guadalupe, and on the left is his wife. And the Virgin of Guadalupe is above, uh, dropping flowers and roses down. But all ever present is the Calaca, whose hand is pointing down into the fields, talking about the vigilance that is needed to maintain the rights of the workers and the ever struggle, ever and never ending struggle about how to balance uh, profit uh, and agribusiness with the, the, the well being of the, the workers. It's, of course, become even more clear to us during the pandemic um, that this is uh, those workers are on the front lines um, of the pandemic and uh, the kind of shock battalions of, of pesticides and of basic workers' rights in terms of the hours that they work and the facilities that they need. In some cases, uh, uh, they're still struggling to have drinking water uh, on the site. Slide, please. So these are the four pieces that were done uh, for the arch uh, and uh, then created as paintings and then produced as these arches of the niches that would go into the to the corbelled arch that represents Chavez's indigenous roots and um, mestizo background. Slide please. A kind of very different idea of, of what um, um, an uh, a monument might look like um, a far cry from the um, the soldier on horseback, uh, you know, with pigeons sitting on, sitting on his head, and and the sort of um, horse horses raising their hoofs as if they could trample you. Instead, uh, he this arch is standing in a circle, and in that circle is a representation of brown feet making the long marches to Delano. And uh, it represents the various marches that, that uh, Chavez took on uh, with, with hundreds and hundreds of people uh, to support the farm workers. A slide, please. So it, it, it's making us, uh, um, it comes full circle, you know, in the sense as, as uh, women workers in Mexico labored to cut the glass for months and place it laboriously into the temples of my painting, templates of my paintings. Many members of their families had left Mexico to come to the United States and work in the fields. Um, they questioned and were eager to know about Cesar Chavez, you know, already knowing that he had worked for the people, nodding their heads in recognition. They dropped the glass in place and they said he worked for the people. This is a workers as we're doing the cleaning of the glass and its placement on the site. Slide, please. There's Dolores Huerta. Oh, back. Let's go back for Dolores for a second. Uh, um, what I wanted to say about this is that this image is um, an image of Dolores that um, I created for two reasons. One is that 
hand outreaching is a hand of um, pleading, a kind of um, questioning and uh, cajoling and encouraging the change of growers. But the other is the fist in the background, which says that she will back that up with a strike, with actions from the people. And the growers would say, you can do anything, but don't bring Dolores because they feared her strength and her capacity to argue in behalf of the, of the, um, of the farm workers. So a, a woman who has been at the center of this movement and continues to work in the benefit of the people in her foundation in the Central Valley, um, uh, who I continue to work with in various projects. So this is a Dolores image that I'm, I really love both controlling and encouraging, but also backing it up with the strength of the, the opposite hand. Slide, please. This is the, the preparation of the surfaces as they are being set in place. Slide, please. So there's the, the completed entrance uh, of Chavez in the fields uh, with the, the moment of the breaking of the fast above. Slide, please. <clears throat> At our dedication, Dolores came, and um, yeah, I thought this was a particular poignant moment uh, when she's looking up at Chavez in recognition of an old friend, and and the various people who were involved in the farm workers movement were present um, through the through the whole process. Um, there are four um, um, stones along this uh, uh, pathway. Um, and they are basically saying, surely the purpose uh, of education is to be of service to others. And they, they talk about um, the, uh, the intention of Chavez in the process. Um, he says, um, let's see if I can find that other quote from him. Um, I can't see it, I can't find it um, quickly here, but essentially the entrance through the arch is the um, east to west uh, of daily movement of the sun also, is a passageway representing a rite of passage from worker to activist. Okay, slide please. <clears throat> um, Oh yes, the, the plaza is treated with color with colors derived from the pre-Hispanic codices, while the arch is finished with a pearlescent white to create a, a sensibility of reflective light within the art architecture. Reflective light is also an important aspect of the United Farm Workers Eagle on the face of the monument. The UFW's flag is a symbol of, to unite the people. The stacked glass eagle is composed of a reverse pyramid and provides the central element of the triumphant arch. The arch faces east to west, receiving the daily movement of the sun through the passageway, representing a rite of passage from worker to archivist. And in this image here, you see a piece in the process of being uh, placed in. You can see how tiny these pieces are and how laborious it is to cut each piece to fit the, the, the template. Slide, please. Um, this uh, is an important moment because Dolores has come to see the piece. She knew I was working on something that would include her, but she had no idea um, that it was going to be something that was absolutely permanent. Um, and she's just at the, in this moment saying to me, how, how long will this last? And I said, Dolores, it will last forever. This is a permanent work. And she's completely incredulous of the fact that this will be there forever. Um, so it, this this is the uh, Dolores Huerta image in the in the, in the arch, and I, I think we managed to produce a work. It was the largest monument uh, to Cesar Chavez that has been made, um, and the most comprehensive in terms of looking at his marches, looking at the um, the statements from Chavez about what he believed education should be about, and what he believed that how people should become activists and how we should support the people who feed the nation. 
So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. That was that was amazing. Um, you know, we had a chance to talk before this a little bit, and I had mentioned that we have used images of um, the arch in some of our conversations when we're talking about the Womenhood um, Project. And um, and you, you know, I was one of I was part of our team of Art Builds community that gets to talk about it, but obviously not in that detail. So I appreciate hearing you know your behind the scenes. Um, with your work and the experiences you had with Dolores Huerta and just um, you know, with the farm workers in the San Joaquin Valley and learning about or experiencing firsthand um, their their lives, their daily lives, their daily struggle, their, their, their daily, you know, I'm sure stories and the way that they had to interact with each other. Um, and, and I think that really speaks to what we are trying to do with womenhood, right? We want to know about those who aren't all whose stories aren't always being told um and you were able to do that with this this um arch through a man that even those who don't live here right knew about or know about um and that's fantastic um you know that that's a, that's that's exactly what we are we are we are wanting to do with the womanhood project is learn about um people who who've been the pillar as you said Dolores Huerta right who's been uh, for Cesar Chavez been the pillar for projects um did you want to speak a little bit more about how um you know uh, that that pillar aspect right I mean we we know that this was a monument um that really kind of you walk through and you you see Cesar Chavez on the, the right and you see him above and but here's these two very strong beautiful um breathtaking um pillars that tell this strong story and there's there's two women on there one who we know by name and one who we don't know by name but we know by the work they do well, um, mm -hmm. when you approach the the monument you see the workers first right and um they're anonymous they're basically they're all they represent all workers <clears throat> so and they represent the show the short hoe the short hoe is in gold because it's almost like a iconic image of of um making wealth uh, but actually impoverishing others right so that becomes the central aspect and then tucked inside is chavez and i think he would have supported that i think he would have liked that idea that put first the the image of the of the people and um, and let the let the let the UFW flag reign over the top, um, but it's also not just the UFW flag, but it but an eagle and an image of strength and light. Um, the whole thing is about the, the the transference of light and of knowledge and of recognition of what people suffered to actually create change. And the monument is a you know in terms of monument making and women's engagement in it. It was uh, exactly that, one of these incredibly um, difficult and requiring of endless patience and, and essentially, you know, doing everything with almost little or no money and, um, and despair, you know, trying to get it up. Uh, right. and, and then dealing with, you know, sort of the male builders, the, the male control systems and, you know, um, People not really understanding what I was doing. <laughs> I, I, you know, over and over again, I've had this experience where, you know, a builder or somebody I was doing a metro rail station. I was using this, these uh, bronze words in in uh, um, indigenous languages, and uh, one of the builders, whose guy's name was actually Bubba, right? Oh, these <laughs> <laughs> big hands in Baldwin Park and. You know, he decided that it didn't have any meaning, so he threw it out. <laughs> like, oh, this, no. Brass letters that were made that were going to be in, embedded in the ground. And he just said, well, this is, doesn't mean anything. Throw it out. I'm just like, too much work, you know. But it's, so you, you're really, you're, you're coming up against um, the old order in every way, you know, in terms of uh, a woman leading a building project. Uh, yeah. um, the notion of how the lighting got left out. For example, mm -hmm. uh, came, became late. Um, the the there were two feet walking in the circle, 
and uh, and and some crazy uh, mess. One of one of the guys left out the second foot. So essentially, oh. the feet walk all the way around the circle, but there's only one foot. It's only a right foot walking across it. I have <laughs> noticed that. Yeah, and that when you spoke about it in your presentation, I was like, thinking to myself, "Why?" Uh, I was trying to remember what you were talking about because I walked through it. Yeah, you know, and okay, so now I know what you're talking about. It's one foot. Yeah, it's one foot. So they're hopping around the circle like, on one foot. But I think it doesn't. It, it's a pre-Hispanic uh, model of you know Coda's image, but. Um, I think it still gets the message across. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly difficult to get one of these things built. And uh, the funding was always in the process of being raised and there wasn't, uh, it was never always in, it was not right in place. Uh, they hedged on the mosaic images. And uh, so I had to put temporary images for, I don't know how many, a couple of years. Oh, wow. Before they would come up with, well, they would come up with the rest of the money to put the mosaics in. Um, well, that's interesting you bring that up. I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off. You? No, no, go ahead. Um, it's interesting you bring that up because you know, part of, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now, right, about monument and what does that look like and those that need to be brought down, um, that need to retell the stories. And I think um, what we also are seeing with this project of womanhood is really trying to um, educate the the the, the community, the people about what it mean, what a monument can look like and the process to getting to it, right? So it's not just, it's not only the funding, which we all know that's a huge, huge part, right? Of course, for many reasons, material, the building, the artists, um, the renderings, everything, but also um, who are the players behind it, right? Who's who's Who are you getting the information from to tell the story um, the way it should be told, right? Who, um, and so, you know, maybe you can share a little bit about how it, it was the relationship with San Jose State, um, with the importance of sharing the stories of and having the representation of of Gandhi, of Cesar Chavez, of, of Dolores Huerta, you know, even um, Robert F. Kennedy. I mean, I think that's really, um, you know, he's been, he came to San Jose, right? And so there's a, there's a lot of little, there's a lot of stories there. Um, and I'm sure a lot of students who go to San Jose State or people who've walked on campus resonate with the farm workers, either as parents, grandparents, aunts, you know, tias, tios, whatever it may be. Um, you know, so, so who, who did you, who, who were the people that you communicated with um, on campus? Were they highly involved? Was it a um maybe a person from the community who suggested you do this project? Was this something, am I, am I completely getting it wrong? Was this something already you wanted to do and you approached them? No, um, I was commissioned to do it um, uh, by, there was a, this, the, the Cesar Chavez Memorial Committee and then also San Jose State. Um, and um, my reach was really wide in terms of uh, how we would represent Cesar Chavez. I mean, I, I spoke to family members. I spoke to people from the UFW. I, as I do with all of, all of my work, I do a very wide reach. And I listened to from the, the most, um, uh, the smallest person, the youngest person to the, to the oldest. And um, to those people who are scholars, to those people who've lived to the experience. Um, and I knew that um, what I was doing was something that uh, was not going to be able to tell all those stories, but how could I, in a built environment, with all these restrictions in terms of, I, I, I had these wonderful metate benches that were to be alongside of things, and, and they were kind of nixed because they didn't want people sitting and laying around and, you know, um, the metates would, I love because then you would have become the kernels of the corn as you sat on the, the metate, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so that it was a relationship between, you know, not aggrandizement, but humility, which I think the Chavez is modeled for us. Mm -hmm. And it's so much the opposite of the kind of leadership that we've seen come from men um, these days, right? Mm -hmm. And almost it's like a, it, it's, sort of, it's starting to permeate so many places, you know, right. the, the, the braggartism, the, um, the narcissism, the, and um, the model of, of um, strength that is not about power over people, right. but power for people, right. Right. right, is what I was trying to get to. And, and I think that comes back from the work I was doing on 
um, the, the the traveling mural, the the world wall, when we brought the Hopi elders in because we were trying to paint a mural, uh, one of the 10 foot by 30 foot pieces. Mm -hmm. um, there are nine of these pieces from all over the world and uh, about a vision of the future without fear, which of course is mm -hmm. how in the world do you do a vision of the future without fear at the moment when we're just dealing with the planet on fire and the, you know, the sort of collapse of the, of, of the environment. And um, my students, we, we was a group of us working on this piece called the peace image, the central image of peace. Mm -hmm. And we realized that we had no image for what peace looked like. Oh, we wow. We couldn't figure out, what, was it everybody sitting around watching TV or was it, you know, like, what was <laughs> uh, So we were struggling with it and we brought in some uh, the Hopi, Hopi elders and they were just so clear. They said, Judy, this isn't difficult. This is really about, you think of it as a passive a concept. It's, you know, everything is in sports terminology, right? It's like, you know, I think at one point Gorbachev was on his fourth down, right? Or, you know, there was, <laughs> we were talking about three strikes and he's out. I mean, we're talking about, you know, all of these terms that come from competitive sports, competitive yeah. politics. And the Hopi said um, that it's an active concept and that it's the ever need to achieve balance so that it's always balancing. And that what had to happen now that the, the, the grandfathers had been teaching and now it was time for the grandmothers to teach. And that if the grandmothers came forward, they would have a different sensibility. And so I have been working on these ideas about um, women's power and women's spiritual leadership and women's connections to the earth and indigenous connections to the earth, which I think we really have to begin to elevate and pay close attention to. I agree. I agree. Wow. Yeah. That's, I love that. I had to write that down. Active concept and is the ever need to maintain balance. Right. For, you know, we, um, in, in this 21st and 20th, 20th century, 21st centuries, um, things just started to get so fast. You know, I mean, you and I both have books behind us, but now we're not, it's not so much that way, right? Um, technology, the the immediate um, need for satisfaction, right? The telling the yes or no, the, the very much black and white instead of realizing that we can have peace by um, being active. And it kind of goes, for me, it goes back to something else. The, the purpose of education is to be in service of others. Right, I kind of see that those two, those that that sentence as well as the um, active concept and is the the piece is the active concept and is the ever need to maintaining balance is the same, right? And so I know when I've walked through the arch, I it's funny you 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 know I I knew that walking through the arch it's it was meant to kind of be this transition, but um, I noticed sometimes when I was I live near I live downtown then when I walk by sometimes I purposely walk around it and it's almost like my body isn't ready to walk through in that during that day like maybe I, I don't I, you know maybe I'm not I don't feel like I'm ready to kind of move with my fist up that day but there are days where I feel powerful and I walk through that arch it's so interesting the way that our bodies feel around public art right I mean it can really move us without thinking about it or saying something out loud and it just becomes this bought this 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 empowerment in your body so i i and maybe because i love art i don't know you know <laughs> you know it's it's there's or i i just um yeah it, it's it's i just had to say i had to say that to you because i'm sure there are others out there that have that feel the same way when they walk when they walk through that arch there's a beauty about it there's this storytelling about it. There's these parts of, there's this, this glow there that makes you smile. And then there's, there's moments of that arch that tell a story where you, you feel sad, you know? And so it really, when you really pay attention to it, it makes you feel everything. I know I've walked around the circle and I've wondered before knowing more information about the story, the, you know, the history of this, of the, the making of this um, monument, I wondered about the grapes and the colors that were chosen, the red and the blue and the gold, 
Um, and I, 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 so I appreciate you sharing. Maybe you can share a little bit more about the importance of the circle and why um, the the arch is, is in the center and the water monument. I don't know if the water was that something you didn't really speak on that. So, you know, that's no, part I, of Earth. I was actually there before, and uh, there was a restriction around it had to stay. Oh. Right? So I had to work around it and somehow incorporate it. I, I mean, the circumscribing of space is what that yeah. circle is about. Um, to create a sacred space, mm -hmm. in a sense. And what would create a sacred space but the ritual of a march, uh, the ritual of a fast, those kinds of... Chavez knew very well how to use those, those techniques, um, not only to, you know, center his um, belief system and, to, and, and his will to continue the boycott, mm -hmm. um, but also to draw attention to an idea and to elevate it, to elevate that idea. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, very, very critical to that idea was a, the, the, the issue of nonviolence. And, Absolutely. You know, right. So that the training of people in nonviolent practice was really essential to the, to the core of, of the work that he did with the UFW, despite of, you know, some kind of brutality that, that he's, that he suffered, that, the UFW suffered with the with the goons coming out into the fields and you know people being strike breakers and all that kind of uh, stuff that happened, and that story is well now becoming well told. Um, but the question is, what what honors a person? Mm -hmm. you know, first of all, there's there's almost no monuments to women anywhere. Okay, right. uh, I I actually have a. I kind of thought that this presentation that I should have got given today would have been about that. I have a, a whole talk on the monuments to women and why there aren't any and what they look like. I mean, there is one monument to a woman artist that's in British Columbia that I have to visit every time I'm there on Vancouver Island. And it's to Emily Carr, this incredible landscape painter who went to find God in the trees and, you know, went out with her, her little trailer and her monkeys and her dogs and, painted in the forest. Uh, but where would you say, where in America could you find a monument to a woman? Mm -hmm. And where in America would you find monuments that are not on the verge of white supremacist ideology? Right. 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 And, and male patriarchal power. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we give it, we make a monument to somebody who was, you know, the, the one who beat everybody up in the block, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one who gets the monument. And I, you know, well, those, uh, you know, the Iwo Jima monument, for example, the flag being raised and, mm -hmm. um, you know, those those things are incredibly powerful images. Maya Lin's monument, for example, and that sort of vaginal entrance into the ground and the names of all the people lost during the Vietnam War. Right. It was so controversial that, the Congress would not let it stand without putting these, you know, vertical character men who were soldiers at the, at the, in front of it, they had to. And that in fact was the opposite. It was, it was a, it was a denigration of that piece in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, it was perfect the way it was. Right? Right. Right. So, so what do we do today? What are the monuments we should build today and to what? Right. Yeah, you know, those are the questions that we have been asking community members through um, other online conversations we've had. We've had the opportunity to, few, to do a few in-person, um, you know, meeting at, at events um, just in the last you know, <laughs> month, kind of. Um, and, you know, it's been interesting to hear people say, well, how do we recognize these group of women that have been a part of the development of Silicon Valley? You know, the ones who, how do we recognize the women who have, who have been the mothers that have gathered to support uh, the, the, the labor movement, the agricultural um, movement here, the, the, um, the education for in high schools and middle schools and, and elementary. So, you know, I think that is a question that we do ask. Is it important to, to recognize a woman who maybe hasn't been, um, in the center of everything or in the front of everything, but should we recognize them singularly or should we recognize it as a group? Yeah, well, what do you think? What are your thoughts on, on something like that? 
Well, I don't think there's any problem that, you know, people don't feel uh, any misgivings about honoring men endlessly, right? Right. Um, for whatever they did. Yeah. Um, I, I think the elevation of even the smallest story is important Absolutely. because it gives a, it gives a, uh, I mean, I just finished the restoration of hitting the wall. Um, our, our, our team just was out doing an amazing restoration uh, with a lot of younger people and women artists helping lead it um, of a woman runner uh, that was painted from 1984 um, as the first woman to run in the marathon because it was yeah. only 1984 when women were allowed to run the marathon okay. for the first time. So this is an image to a, of a uh, athlete but not really. It's about it, it's a metaphor for the larger issue of marathon, of endurance, of sustaining, of resilience, and of the fact that women, women's bodies, women's spirit, um, are those that are spirits that are sustaining spirits. In other words, mm -hmm. we give birth, we nurture life, and um, and all of those things that make us really fearful. I think, and perhaps maybe are the very basis of misogyny. Right. Right. Yeah. So what you're looking at is this figure that comes through a giant wall that represents the old order of hand hewn marble. Right. Yeah. And, the, and the Tower of Babel is within it and the everything is falling at her feet. And she is coming through a rope, not a ticket, not a not, not a um, not a uh, finish line. And behind her are all these women lining up to come through a heart and right through that stone wall. Because basically courage, I, I looked up this definition that courage said working more at heart. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty good description of courage. And so I thought of these women coming through the heart and up behind her in time for the Olympics. Now I had to, I had to sue Caltrans Ooh. to get that piece back up because they painted over it repeatedly. Wow. Yeah. It would get graffitied and they would paint over it rather than, you know, save the mural. They would destroy the whole thing to take off the despised graffiti. Right. So that's just them not understanding how, you know, the, the importance. And, we you know, it could be that it was a, it's a woman. So they don't see it as. Yeah, I'm, I'm just now it makes me think if it was a man on there depicted and uh, would they have painted over it? We don't know. Well, first, of all, first, there's all yeah. There's that. There's also the sort of disrespect of art and artists. Right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if anything, the first thing I would think that they would reach out to you or figure out a way to reach out to the artist, whoever it is that they to connect. But with you. We had we demonstrated we could maintain it, right? All we needed was access to the freeway. So this main this new restoration <clears throat> is going to be another interesting test as we keep it maintained mm -hmm. and we struggle with the young men who paint over it. They mm -hmm. paint over her legs mm -hmm. as if to stop her running. What is that about? I mean, there are blank walls to the left and the right and they, they choose to paint over her legs. Wow. It was as if they create these barriers. And I, I think it's deeply psychological, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, it's like interesting to watch figures of women in public sites. Right. Yeah. And, um, so, yes, I think we need to celebrate the smallest achievements to the largest achievements and that the smallest achievements would give young girls, young women, the possibility of thinking I could do something significant. Uh, uh, and how I how you struggle through um, those kinds of difficulties. Right. Um, and have the resilience to see your idea through. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, and I have, you know, almost every monument in some way has had to resist, has to deal with a, a kind of, if it moves forward with some strength, it gets a blowback. Mm -hmm. Perhaps none of them were as big as the blowback that happened in my Metro Rail station in San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. The San Gabriel Park, it, it's actually called the, right next to the Mission San Gabriel in Baldwin Park, mm -hmm. which uh, um, save our state which is a right-wing group, long before Trump was in place mm -hmm. and long before we were aware that there was this huge hatred of immigrants that was seething below the surface. Mm 
um, a small group of them came out to remove a metro rail station that I blew, uh, uh, built. And that was another arch like this one, although it was a different kind of arch. It was an arch that was making a reference to historic mission arches and four oh. different, in four different directions. I was working with the, the Tangva um, leadership at that time, wonderful family and woman um, that um, she and her husband lived within walking distance of Mission San Gabriel, but she would never put her foot on the grounds of the uh, of the mission because mm -hmm. her her family had been uh, neophytes in that mission and um, had died there. And so um, she said, if you really want to do something that represents us, you'll build a um, memorial, a, a prayer mound to uh, Toy Purina who was the young woman who led a revolt against the mission San Gabriel in 1785. And so that's what I did. And I built the arches there. But 20 years later, Save Our State, the right wing anti-immigrant forces came out and said, you little Baldwin Park City, you don't have the right to put that up. <clears throat> Even though <clears throat> you went through a big process and Judy engaged everybody in the process and the youngest mayor in the country was the at, at the leadership. Fidel Vargas who was an amazing guy to work with. Um, the city council was in, you know, the yeah. city council was all of mixed race. Wow! Um, and uh, so this piece went up, and it was five metro stops and an arch and a hundred foot plaza with language. That's where I was talking about Bubba. Mm, well, yes, okay. Language, um, and that became a very difficult debate in which they came from Ventura, which was 85 miles away, 40 of them. And uh, it was a whole group of um, the forces that, you know, uh, passed 187, uh, the anti-immigrant law that basically said you couldn't get medical care or go to school mm -hmm. if you were you didn't have papers. Um, and uh, it was a huge upheaval in that city. Wow. And actually, my retrospective um, at the Museum of Latin American Art has a wonderful vignette, a whole piece on what happened in Baldwin Park and a close up look in 2006 of this brewing sentiment that has been here as the underbelly all along. In other words, it didn't just arise with Trump. He figured out how to harness that, mm -hmm. he figured out how to to harness it and direct it and make it political power. Yeah. And what we have to do essentially in the work that we have to do in the future is we have to address it and understand it and know that that has to, we have to change that in some essential ways. Absolutely. We, we have a pandemic of ignorance. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. a profound pandemic of ignorance and that ignorance needs to be addressed what have our communities and our peoples of color and of women contributed to the building of our country? And that, right. knowledge, that knowledge is empowering, right? And right. we triumphed over Baldwin Park. They were not able to remove our, um, they, they were not able to remove that, that piece. And the mission, the, the prayer mound to Toy Purina still is there. And it's interestingly enough, they weren't mad about the prayer mound. They were mad about Gloria Ansel Duhl's statement saying this land was Mexican once, was Indian always and will be again from her poem. Oh, wow. Wow. That's what- It was not the, wow. <laughs> How? They, 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 were, they were so ignorant, they didn't even understand <laughs> what, the, what they really should have been mad about. Yes. If, that is so interesting. Yeah. It, I mean, it really is because it, it goes it goes back to the importance of telling the stories, telling yeah. telling the stories of others, and and not even just telling those stories, but reaching out, doing it in a way where you reach out to communities that aren't that aren't always aware or 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 know to look for that, right? And so I think that you know, as we come to the end of our 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 time, yeah, I want to mention that. Um, you just said it, right? We are in the pandemic of ignorance and, and it needs to be addressed by telling the stories of, the, of our people. Um, 
and I, I really believe, and I believe my colleagues feel this way um, with our bills communities, that the way we do is we, we, we go out to those people. How do we go to those people in areas that wouldn't come to us? We can't expect them to always come to us, right? Sometimes, yes, it'd be nice, but we need to go out there. We need to talk to them. We need to communicate. Um, we need to find out what stories do they have that we need to learn also, right? So it's not just a one-way thing. How are we always learning and how are we always keeping the the education of others continuing in this in a circular way? Right. And so well, yeah. I think every monument has a job and that is education. Right. We should not just think we'll make an esoteric, beautiful thing here that will just be a nice piece of shade to sit in. Right? Yeah. <laughs> has to, I think, honestly, the, the, the purpose of a monument is to bring the past into the present to change the future. Yes. And I, and, and I think, you know, and people need to be, artists really need to know that you may get resistance. It may be, I mean, I had death threats, um, like six feet of death threats on the internet um, around the Baldwin Park. Uh, I believe it. And so I, I actually was going to change the title of my biography to, I don't know why they're trying to kill me. It's only art. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> no, I'm working on a, I'm, I'm working on something called Painting in the River of Angels. So I hope that I can oh, get okay. back to it now. But I, yeah. and I think, I think really, understanding resilience and how to deal with resentment and and kind of hate. How do you, in the face of hate, deal with it? I mean, the strategies that Gandhi used and that that, that uh, Chavez used, um, we can learn from those. Mm -hmm. um, and also, how can we resist becoming martyrs too? I don't really see that as being the the um, the choice you have, but I do think that you need to learn resilience and a method of staying calm in light of people's rage. Yeah. How do you how do you meet rage? How do you meet um, ignorance? Yeah. And how are you supportive and, in a sense, loving enough to make it move? past where it is, right? Yeah. To another place. Absolutely. And I'm just saying that's no easy task, right? Oh, absolutely not. It's not it's not black or white, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, there, and there's some people who can do it. I mean Chavez was one of our great examples of person who could do it. Right. Absolutely. And now we we have an opportunity to not only walk by him, but those who who influenced him and those who walked along with him when we go through your arch. So thank yeah. you so much, Judy. We we absolutely appreciate and so grateful for your time with us today for saying yes to meeting with us for to discuss um the importance of the monument and to letting us share our womanhood project um with you and you know we we just couldn't be more grateful so you know, thank you so much i think we need monuments to poet women poets absolutely, would you absolutely. Like that? i would love that i would love to have monuments to women poets well, you know what? I think we're going to have to brainstorm with you after this. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much again. You know, we we really do appreciate it. So, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. We are so grateful. I want to remind everyone to go to our website womanhoodproject.org. This is your opportunity to nominate a person. And it can be your teacher you had in third grade. It can be the amazing um, woman who um, you read about in your local newspaper, uh, whatever it may be. Um, go ahead and, and nominate them on the website. Um, we will have that information. We will be at, we'll, have, we'll be asking for more information after you see, uh, you, you type in your answer here. Um, and, and then please visit uh, our co-urbanized website where you have the opportunity to pin on a map our entire county of which this project is um, really focusing on uh, where we where we are trying to identify where women should be recognized, where they are already recognized that we don't know about, and the types of art um, that you would like to see. I think we have another slide here. And you know, as you, for those of you who have been part of the conversation when we started in April, thank you for coming back and joining us for today's conversation. It was amazing. Um, 
we want we are going to continue into September and October. So please come back as um, and if this is your first time, you're more than welcome to to check out artists honoring women. Dot, I mean, sorry, womanhood.org. We have a YouTube page. You can watch the previous conversations. They are all incredible conversations with fantastic and amazing artists that are recognizing uh, women and communities. So we will see all of you in September. And thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.